In the final weeks of Jesus' earthly ministry, he resolutely turned his face toward Jerusalem. Several times he told his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem where he would die and then rise again. As he walked this path to the cross, he encountered a number of men and women who had a significant impact on his journey and to whom he reached out in love and grace. As we journey through the Lenten season, I want to look at six of the people involved in the journey of Jesus to the cross and the empty tomb. We'll meet Mary of Bethany, Judas Iscariot, Caiaphas, Pontius Pilate, Simon of Cyrene, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus had many followers throughout his ministry. There were his disciples, of course, who were with him at all times. There were others who supported his ministry financially and sat on, in on his teachings whenever they could. And there were others who didn't see him as much because of their location and responsibilities in life. But when he came their way, they sought to learn as much as possible from him. One such person was Mary of Bethany. She saw and heard Jesus only occasionally because she lived near Jerusalem while most of his ministry was spent in Galilee. Now Bethany was a town just outside of Jerusalem, and there Mary lived with her sister and brother Martha and Lazarus. This family makeup seems a bit unusual. It seems that the parents of these three have passed on, but also the women seem to be of unmarried and therefore under the care of Lazarus. Perhaps the girls are still young. It is unlikely that they are widows, for no husband is mentioned. But we first meet Mary when Jesus and his disciples visit the household. And Luke tells us, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to them. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now Jesus and his disciples are enjoying the hospitality of this family in Bethany. And as would be customary, food and refreshments were being prepared, and probably accommodations for the night. And this was the work of women. Martha, of course, was dutifully engaged in that task, scurrying here and there to make things ready. And then she notices her sister has thrown aside both social custom and her responsibilities and is seated with the men listening to Jesus. Now, normally men would recline on couches or sit in chairs when they were visiting together. But the disciples would sit at the feet of the rabbis. Serious disciples would be preparing to be teachers and following the teachings of their rabbi. And so Mary's behavior here demonstrates that she wants to be a disciple and a proclaimer of Jesus' message. Martha, on the other hand, feels her sister is slacking off, not fulfilling the responsibilities that fall to women, and points this out to Jesus. No doubt Martha expected Jesus to reprove Mary, but instead he shockingly approves of Mary's behavior. While hospitality is important, he says, Mary has discovered something of greater importance, listening to the rabbi. Jesus' response to Martha's complaint also challenges the model of discipleship in the first century. By praising Mary for choosing the place of a disciple, Jesus is stating that the role of the disciple and future minister of his message is open to women as well. 
Are we not like Martha sometimes, busily engaged in doing things for Jesus, but forgetting that Jesus wants us to spend time with him? When we're too busy to spend time in the presence of Jesus and sit listening to him, we miss out on the great blessings he has for us. Just imagine you have some very special guests come to your house for a visit. Of course, you want to give them the best. And so while they relax in your living room, you bustle about cooking a wonderful roast beef dinner, baking a pie, making coffee, cleaning the bathroom, but never sit to visit with them. And when the meal is ready, you're constantly jumping up to fill their water glass, provide more food, or take care of other tasks. And soon they have to leave. And after they've gone, you realize that in all your busyness, you didn't really visit with them. You never really took the time to sit and listen to their stories, answer their questions, or ask your own. Well, Jesus wants us to be like Mary and take time with him. Now, the next time we see Mary, she's grieving. Her brother Lazarus has died. When he was sick, they sent a message to Jesus, but Jesus delayed his coming, and when he finally arrived, Lazarus had been buried for four days. Martha went out to meet Jesus, but Mary stayed at the house. And then when Martha returned and called Mary, Mary approached him. And we read, Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him. She fell at his feet and said, Lord! If you had been here, my brother would not have died. In Mary's words, we hear her anguish and her anger, but also an expression of great faith. Mary believed Jesus could have and would have healed Lazarus had he arrived in time. But now she was heartbroken. Not only was there a deep love and devotion to her sibling, But of course, in that culture, women on their own were in a rather precarious position and situation. Jesus is moved by her grief. And indeed, he feels it himself. He is moved to tears. We read that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of Jesus' compassion and understanding when he writes, We don't have a high priest who's out of touch with our reality. He's been through the weakness of testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Jesus is tender and compassionate towards Mary. He grieves with her. And then he does the unimaginable and raises Lazarus to life. Imagine what Mary felt. I mean, one moment she's filled with deep grief. And the next, there's this overwhelming joy. After this amazing event, Mary's love and devotion to Jesus only grew deeper. Jesus had told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And now Mary and Martha and many others saw a display of Jesus' resurrection power. A dead man had been raised to life. Now, healing a sick person, Restoring the sight of the blind, giving strength to useless limbs, calming storms, feeding a multitude with a small lunch. Such miracles are terrific, but paled in comparison to giving life to the dead. The fact that Lazarus has been entombed for four days left no doubt that he had been dead. Now there was no doubt he was alive. And this led to two reactions. We read that many put their faith in Jesus, but that the priests, the chief priests and others determined to kill Jesus before something happened which might destroy their grip on power. But what about Mary? 
Certainly she was overwhelmed by this act and longed to show her gratitude. And we read in John 12, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. and She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help him to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So John records that a dinner was held in Jesus' honor. While the dinner took place in Bethany, Matthew tells us it was held at the home of Simon the leper. Now, obviously, Simon had been cured of his leprosy, quite probably, healed by Jesus. Once again, we see Martha is serving, even though it's Simon's house. While Lazarus, Simon, and others are reclining at the table, Mary appears, breaks open a jar of expensive perfume, and pours it over Jesus' feet, and then wipes his feet with her hair. Now, this was shocking to the guests for a number of reasons. First of all, because of social convention. Decent women kept their hair covered in public. For example, a bride on her wedding night would let her hair down to be seen by her husband for the very first time. By unloosing her hair, not only would be Mary shock people, but she was making some form of an ultimate pledge of loyalty to Jesus. And so Mary, without concern for others' opinions, acted to show her love and devotion to Christ. It reminds me of the time that David had the Ark of the Covenant brought into Jerusalem. In the celebration, David stripped down to a simple linen robe and danced with abandon in the streets. His wife, Michael, took offense, believing his actions brought disgrace on the king. David responded, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. David was devoted to the Lord and focused on showing his love and praise to God, not caring what others thought. The second thing that would shock people by Mary's actions was the expense of it. This perfume, we're told, was worth about a year's wages. Now, in today's terms, that would be nearly $30,000 at minimum wage. It's no surprise that Judas Iscariot objected and voiced what no doubt others were also probably thinking. Now, of course, we find out that Judas's motives were selfish. He was thinking of how much money he could have stolen for himself. But Judas, Jesus immediately cast those objections aside. He was, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Jesus knew what lay ahead, his sacrificial death and resurrections. The Jews did not embalm their dead, but they did wrap the body and anoint it with perfume or spices that would help mask the stench of a decaying body. Pastor Paul Nielsen of the Lutheran Church in Waterfield, Maine, writes this, Somehow, Mary accepts the fact that Jesus is going into Jerusalem and that he will be arrested and die. 
Unlike the disciples, she does not try to dissuade Jesus from going to Jerusalem. She accepts it. Somehow, she understands that this is something he must do to accomplish his mission. And when I say somehow, I do not mean magically. I mean as a result of having sat at his feet and listened to him with an undivided attention. This is how the Holy Spirit works true faith in us. Just how much Mary understood, we're not told, but her love and devotion are clearly expressed. And Jesus commends her for her sacrificial expression of devotion to him. She has done what she could. Mary began by sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his teaching. She grew in faith, believing he could have healed her sick brother. She was surprised by Jesus' even greater power over death, but that led her to a costly devotion. No price was too great for her to pay to show Jesus her gratitude and love. Let us reflect on what Jesus has done for us and continues to do in us. May we, like Mary, take time to sit at his feet and listen to his voice. May we respond to his teaching in faith, stepping out in our daily lives with acts of devotion. Let us recognize that no sacrifice on our part can ever repay Christ for the salvation that he purchased on Calvary at the cost of his own life. May God bless you.